In this video, we will review anemia caused by increased destruction or loss of red cells. In another video, we reviewed the red cell life cycle, emphasizing the maturation from erythroblast to reticulocyte, the 120-day lifespan in the circulation, the removal of old red cells by macrophages in the reticuloendothelial system, and the catabolism of heme to bilirubin. We learn that there are only two basic pathophysiologies of anemia, either decreased production, a marrow problem, or increased red cell destruction or loss. In this session, we will cover the destruction side of the equation. There are two major destructive causes of anemia, bleeding and death of the red cells before the usual 120-day lifespan. This premature death is called hemolysis. In either event, you end up with anemia, fewer circulating red cells, abnormally low hematocrit, and abnormally low hemoglobin. The first organ to detect this anemia as hypoxia is the kidney. In reaction, it produces erythropoietin, a growth factor with many effects on the bone marrow. The first noticeable effect is release of reticulocytes, and depending on the magnitude of the erythropoietin bump, the release of so-called stress reticulocytes, very young, bluish reticulocytes with so much RNA that you don't need a special stain to know their reticulocytes. In some cases, even nucleated red cells are released into the circulation. The classic pattern for increased destruction is anemia with a high reticulocyte count, sometimes with polychromatophilia with increased numbers of bluish red cells. If the destruction anemia and erythropoietin stimulation persist for a long time, the erythroid portion of the marrow will expand and folate requirements increase. None of these findings distinguish between the two causes of excess loss anemia, bleeding and hemolysis. The major clues for this distinction is finding the bleeding site in bleeding patients and finding biochemical markers of heme catabolism in the patients with hemolysis. If bleeding persists, iron requirements increase. For the remainder of this video, we will look more closely at the hemolytic anemias and their diagnostically useful biochemical footprints. In most hemolytic anemias, the red cell itself is abnormal and is gobbled up by macrophages in the reticuloendothelial system well before the normal 120 days. That leads to the pattern we are familiar with, anemia with increased reticulocytes and sometimes polychromatophilia. What distinguishes hemolysis from bleeding, where the red cells cleanly exit the body, is that in hemolysis, some red cell contents spill into the plasma. The small amount of hemoglobin that spills is immediately bound to the plasma protein haptoglobin, which brings it to macrophages to recycle the iron and process the heme. In the process, plasma haptoglobin levels fall. Small amounts of red cell LDH also leak out, raising plasma LDH levels. Meanwhile, all the excessive red cell phagocytosis creates a high bilirubin load. That increases the plasma indirect bilirubin. The classic pattern of hemolysis is anemia with increased reticulocytes elevated LDH and indirect bilirubin, and decreased haptoglobin. If this process goes on from months to years, the marrow develops erythroid hyperplasia and increased folate requirements. Bilirubin gallstones may develop and can cause biliary obstruction, resulting in direct hyperbilirubinemia on top of the indirect hyperbilirubinemia. In some cases, Instead of taking place predominantly in the macrophage, the red cell destruction takes place right in the circulation. This is called intravascular hemolysis. The major difference is that large amounts of hemoglobin are spilled into the plasma, overwhelming the ability of haptoglobin to sequester and carry the plasma hemoglobin to the reticuloendothelium. The haptoglobin level falls to zero, and free floating hemoglobin appears in the plasma. Plasma LDH and indirect bilirubin rise. 
The free hemoglobin, now in dimeric form, is filtered in the kidney, and some of the hemoglobin is reabsorbed in tubule cells where the iron gets bound up as hemosiderin. If the capacity for resorption is exceeded, hemoglobin and hemosiderin in shed tubule cells appear in the urine. If that process continues for a long period of time, iron losses become significant and result in increased iron requirements. In summary, when hemolysis is primarily accomplished by macrophages, it is called extravascular and is characterized by anemia with elevated reticulocytes, indirect hyperbilirubinemia, increased plasma LDH, and decreased plasma haptoglobin. The same features are present in intravascular hemolysis with the addition of free hemoglobin in the plasma, hemoglobinuria, and with time, hemosidinuria. You can get a feel for how long a patient has experienced hemolysis. Within hours to days, there will be reticulocytosis, indirect hyperbilirubinemia, increased LDH, and decreased haptoglobin. And in the case of intravascular hemolysis, hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, and eventually hemosidinuria. Within days to weeks, marrow erythroid hyperplasia appears and folate requirements increase. When hemolysis is present for years, bilirubin gallstones appear. All of these features occur in extravascular or intravascular hemolysis, but only chronic intravascular hemolysis can result in iron deficiency.